This week, Tim and I answer as many of your questions as possible about the Chateau and our lives here, including do we live here, how did we find her, what are our future plans, and the most commonly asked question, how much is this all going to cost, and can we actually save her? So we received several questions asking whether we looked at other chateaus before Pernon, how we found her, and why it is that we chose Chateau de Pernon over all the other possible chateaus. And so to answer that question, we're standing here in front of Pernon's 1812 gate. We did look at other chateaus. We looked at 15 chateaus before we finally found Pernon. And they were remarkable buildings, all in different architectural styles, all in different regions of France and with many different characteristics. We found Pernon because our agent immobilier, our real estate agent, had shown us another property and when we described the things that we were looking for, he said that we had to come and have a look at Chateau de Pernon. It wasn't listed online, so we'd never seen her before. And so the answer to the question of why we chose Chateau de Pernon above all of the others really is obvious when you look at her sitting behind me right now. It's her extraordinary architectural style and the amazing natural setting that she sits in. Her English park at the back, the extraordinary Grand Allée that extends out in front of me where I'm standing right now. Her harmony and symmetry with the two enormous Kumar or outbuildings that are flanking each side of the quarter on her. And the fact that she rests in her juices, as they say literally in French, that she's in the original style, in the original state that she would have been when she was originally constructed at the end of the 18th century. We fell in love with her as soon as we stepped out of the car and cast eyes on her for the very first time. Do we live here at the Chateau? Where do we sleep? Do we stay in this restored bedroom? So many questions about our life here at the Chateau. So yes, we live here at the Chateau. We live in a bedroom on the ground floor, but unfortunately, no, we do not use this restored bedroom as our own bedroom. And there's two reasons for that. The first reason is that we completed the bedroom so that our friends and family could come and stay this summer and have somewhere comfortable to stay. And it's the first time that anyone's been able to stay here in comfort. The bathroom is now fully functional. So really throughout spring and summer and actually autumn because it's been quite warm, this bedroom has been used by friends and family. And so we haven't had a chance to stay up here, but that is how we planned it. And the second reason is much more practical. In fact, we're still in the process of reflecting on how we can comfortably live in the chateau, how we can heat it. And the premier etage now that winter's coming just becomes too cold to be comfortable up here. And so we will close this bedroom down now and it won't be used again until next spring. And in the meantime, there's a lot of work for us to do on the plumbing and electrical works up here and to try and work out what we can do to heat the chateau and make it more comfortable and who knows maybe one day in the future this will become our principal bedroom we're still yet to make a decision on that
So one of the questions that was asked was, what's the era that we're aiming for in the restoration of Chateau de Pernon? Well, Pernon was constructed at the end of the 18th century, and that's during the period of the reign of Louis XVI. And so the exterior of the chateau is in the architectural style of Louis XVI. And so it's not surprising that we find that the interior mimics that same style. So what are the features? Well, we can see them here in this door, straight lines, and it's all about harmony and symmetry. Whatever we do on one side of a room, we'll see the same features on the other side of the room. So even with doors, it doesn't matter whether the doors on the other side of the room are fake or real. The important thing is harmony and symmetry. And that's the style that we're aiming for in the restoration of the interiors of Chateau de Pernon, the style of harmony and symmetry that we associate with Louis XVI. All of the rooms of the chateau were built during that era and mimic that style, with the exception of one room. This room, Chateau de Pernon's Grand Salon. And the reason why it's different is because it was restored at the end of the 19th century. And it was restored in the style of Louis XV, the Rocaille style, or as we would say in English, the Rococo style. And we can see it here with this fireplace, which replaced the original, a neoclassic Louis XVI fireplace, which we found in Pernon's attic. This replacement with its curved lines are the sign of the Rococo style, the Louis XV style. And they even added these little features onto the boiserie, onto the wood panelling, to emphasise the change in style of the rooms. If we look around the room, we can see small paintings above the wood panelling. They also reflect the Louis XV style, which was back in fashion at the end of the 19th century. And so all of the rooms will be restored to the original Louis XVI style, except this room, Chateau de Pernon's magnificent Grand Salon. How many rooms are there? How many rooms have we renovated? How many rooms are left to renovate? Well, the chateau itself has 105 rooms, and that's including the service rooms and dressing rooms, and so all the small rooms also in the chateau. And that doesn't include all the outbuildings and the other houses on the property. So there's a gardener's cottage which is in ruin. There's this farmhouse here, which is actually older than the chateau itself. And there's all the accommodation in the Comal, the two dependants as well. So for the farmhouse that I'm in here and the gardener's cottage and some of the other buildings with accommodation, a lot of them are in ruin and we haven't actually had the chance yet to assess whether they'll be usable or not. This building in particular has so much charm and we have so much hope for it. But as you can see, currently it's just a ruin. So the answer to the question is in the chateau, there's 105 rooms. We've renovated just two, which leaves 103 rooms in the chateau itself left to go. We have a lot of work ahead of us. So we're here in Pernon's Shea, or Old Barrel Room, and it's here that they would have crushed and fermented the grapes that were grown on the estate back when Pernon was a wine-producing domain. And we're here to answer the question of how much will all of the works cost and how long will the entire project take? And I'm Sorry to lead with the bad news that we don't know the real answer to either of those questions. 
Now, you might think it's pretty irresponsible to buy a chateau and to take on a project like this when you don't really know how much it's going to cost. But the truth is, with a project like Chateau de Pernon's restoration, on a monument historic where the entire estate is classified and protected by the French heritage authorities, it's impossible to know how much the cost of a project like this will be. And that's because before each stage of works, we need to carry out a etude diagnostic or a diagnostic study to tell us all of the heritage elements within a particular precinct or within a particular building before we can commence the works and obtain the quotations uh, and talk to the companies that will actually deliver the works to find out what the true cost will be. And so it's very difficult for us to say what the total cost of a, the restoration project will be, but we do know that it will be several millions of euros at least, just based on the first stage of works. How long will it take? Well, we don't really know. But Flick and I are realistic, and we know that we probably won't get to all the parts of the property in our lifetime. There'll be something left for the next generation of owners of Chateau de Pernon for them to restore and for them to save. And I guess for us, it's a reminder that like all the best things in life, it's the journey, not the destination. For us, it's the fun and the excitement of the project that we've got before us and we'll do as much as we can to safeguard and protect Chateau de Pernon while we're the custodians of this extraordinary property, but it'll be a future generation, perhaps, that finish the work that we've started. What's our favourite find? What's our most interesting find? What's the find that has most touched our hearts? Well, to share my favourite find with you, we need to come up here to the premier etage or the first floor. So I've brought you up here to the room that we affectionately call the fabric room. And it's in this bedroom that we've stored all the fabrics that we found here at the Chateau. Come and have a look at this. In the grenier or the attic of the chateau, when we arrived, there were two huge armoires that were full of fabrics. Some of them are original fabrics from the chateau. And for a fabric lover like myself, it was an absolute treasure trove. But it's this particular garment that really stole my heart. This incredible hand sewn silk garment is so fragile. So I'm going to pop it on the mannequin so you can have a good look at it. And actually, while we're doing this, this mannequin is also one of my favorite finds here. Look at the body shape. It's got this incredible hourglass shape with a very tightly tucked in waist. Isn't this just so superb? You can see all the beautiful hand stitching, the pocket liner. There's a tiny amount of boning, but not very much and just the most incredible shape. Look at the shape of these sleeves. Every time I look at it, it still takes my breath away. But I'm intrigued to see what Tim's response to this question is. Let's go see if we can track him down. The thing that I discovered most unexpectedly that most stole my heart was right here in this bureau, 
stashed right at the back, hidden away in this cupboard. And it's this set of intimate letters from the beginning of the 19th century. And they're letters between the Marquis Ashar de la Haye and one of his daughters. And I can't pretend to understand all of the old French in some of them, but they're clearly letters between two people who really care deeply about each other. And look, a song in this beautiful handwriting. And these proverbs from the beginning of the 19th century, some which we still use today. The first one, l'amour est aveugle, love is blind, a bon chat, bon rat. Literally, a good cat, a good rat, meaning that the struggle between two adversaries brings out the best qualities in each of them. I just love these. And when I found them, I just couldn't believe my eyes. Do we have children? Have you not met Mademoiselle Truff? Truff is our little fur baby. She's half Legoto, which is an Italian water dog used to hunt truffles. And in fact, her mother is an active truffle hunter who may have fallen for the charms of the neighbor's Australian sheepdog. So she's half Legoto, half sheepdog, and she's just a complete delight. Aren't you Truff? What's wrong? You got something on your paw? So we're here in Pernon's Chapel in the Comar West or the Western Outbuilding. And we received many questions about our plans for the future restoration of this building and what the timetable for that might be. Now, some will know that this is a building that has enormous issues and problems. Currently, it's supported at the back by a modern structure, which is protecting the building because it's suffered from subsidence issues and it's shifted and moved in the past. Before we can carry out the restoration of this building, we need to gather information about whether or not that movement has stopped. And so we've installed a dozen or so of these small movement gauges. And they have been in place now for almost two years and they're gathering information as to whether the almost imperceptible movement in this building has stopped or whether it's continuing. After we've gathered that information, we'll be able to commence an etude diagnostic or a diagnostic study that will tell us all sorts of important information about the current heritage features in this building, about its current state and health effectively, and about the best strategy and the best plan for restoring her. That etude diagnostic or that study will then form the basis for us obtaining quotations, which will tell us what the potential cost of a restoration of this building will be. It's a building that Flick and I desperately want to save. It has this beautiful chapel in it. It also has Pernon's stables, and we would love to bring horses back to daily life here at the chateau. It has beautiful tack rooms that may be frankly beyond salvation and it also has an extraordinary oak staircase, a spiral staircase in the centre of the building that leads up to the grenier or the attic. So there is so much 
charm about this building that we want to safeguard, save and ultimately restore. But we can't be sure right now what the timeline or even the cost for doing a restoration like this will be. Why did we fix the pool before starting other projects? Interesting question. A pool was added here at Pernod in the 90s and when we arrived it was well overgrown, the liner had collapsed in, there was a tree coming through the centre and it was just a, a complete mess down here. And as we've already discussed, Pernod is class A monument historic, the highest level of protection to a property. And what that meant is we weren't able to start work on the inside of the chateau until a proper diagnostic study had been done. And also with the condition of the roof so bad, we really couldn't start working on the inside anyway until the roof was secure and there were no longer leaks on the inside of the chateau. And so what we did is started to work on the grounds of the chateau. Hello, Truff. So we started clearing the grounds, organising outside spaces, and our strategy behind that was that we could then have the grounds under control by the time the roof of the chateau had been completed. And so the pool was an obvious place for us to start working on. It meant that also in this crazy time when the chateau is so hectic with tradesmen and so on, that we would have a space where we could actually come and relax and enjoy. And so by the second summer, the pool was completed and we now have this lovely space to escape to at the end of the day in summer, which is really beautiful. And you may remember when we arrived, there were garden beds surrounding the outside of the chateau. They were protecting the terraces and the moat and they had dahlias in them. And at the end of the first summer, we pulled up the dahlias and overwintered them. And then we couldn't put them back down around the moat because of the works that were about to start. And when we were working down at the pool, this garden bed here at the side of the pool is quite enormous and was just full of weeds and goodness knows what. And so that spring we put the dahlia bulbs here next to the pool and they've been very happy here during summer. We get this beautiful sea of red flowers, which is really delightful. And so there you have it. That's the reason that we started working on the pool quite early after we arrived here. We're in the attic in Pernon's central dome. It's the biggest room in the chateau. It's more than 70 square metres. And we're here to answer the question, the very difficult question, what does success look like? And I suppose for Flick and I, first and foremost, success means saving this extraordinary chateau. When we found her, she was only a few years away from total ruin and complete catastrophe. And so every day when the workers are on site, when Flick and I are working on our different projects around the domain, every day we know that step by step, we are getting closer to safeguarding and saving this amazing place that was in peril when we first found her. And what does saving her mean? Well, it means respecting the patrimoine, respecting the heritage, which is at the heart of everything that we love and adore about Chateau de Pernon. It means safeguarding everything original that can be saved from this amazing building. And where things can't be saved and restored, it means using the best materials and traditional techniques to make sure that what we restore and what we renew is done in a way that respects heritage 
and respects the history of this amazing building. And if we can do that, and if we can save her, and if we can protect her for future generations, for us here at Chateau de Pernon, that's what success looks like. What are our future plans for the Chateau? Can you visit? Can you stay? So many questions about the future of the Chateau. So whilst the Chateau is our home, it is always our goal to share Pernod. And that's why within four months of arriving two years ago, we had Pernod open to the public for the very first time for the Journée du Patrimoine, which you've heard us speak about before, but it's a weekend each year in September when private properties that are normally closed to the public are open to the public for the weekend. And during this time of urgent works, this is really the only time that we can open Pernod because as you can see, it's a work site and it's not a very safe place for the public to be at the moment. But in the future, it certainly is our goal to share Pernod more. Our challenge, however, is that even after the first stage of urgent work to restore the chateau roof and facades, there are still many elements of the outside of the chateau which remain quite fragile. The walls of the moat are quite fragile. The walls of the terraces in front of the chateau are also quite fragile. And on top of that, the inside of the chateau remains unrenovated and in some parts, very dangerous as well. So as you can see, even after this first stage of urgent works to protect Pernod, there remains a lot of work to do to be able to open her safely to the public. However, it is certainly our goal to share Pernod as much as possible and we look forward to being able to host beautiful events here, weddings and cultural events, to share Pernod and ensure that everybody has the chance to enjoy her beauty. So we're here at the western limit of Chateau de Pernon's border. And in fact, the wall you can see behind me here is the border of our property with our neighbours. And we're here to answer the question of what happened at Chateau de Pernon during the various wars of the 19th and 20th century. And we've chosen to answer this question from here because this building that you can see behind me, even though it's not actually on our property, was a hospital during the Franco-Prussian War. And although the fighting itself didn't actually take place, thankfully, here on the domain at Chateau de Pernon, the French army did arrive here during the final weeks and months of that war. The 15th Regiment of Garde Mobile from Calvados in Normandy in France came and stayed here for several weeks. And the soldiers would have been camped here on the estate's property. And we have a letter from, or we found a letter from, one of the lieutenants from that regiment who writes a poem or a, a song in reverence of Mademoiselle Montesquieu, who would have been living here at the time. And interestingly enough, she was charged with the responsibility of transmitting the commutation of a death sentence that was passed on one of the French soldiers who was serving here for insubordination. And that death sentence, thankfully, was commuted to uh, a couple of years of public works. It must have been very, very good news for him. During the First World War, again, the fighting didn't come anywhere near Chateau de Pernon. It was many, many hundreds of miles away on the Western Front. But the son of the Marquis, Pierre Robinard de Rochecary, did serve with the French army. He was an officer in the 8th Regiment of Curassiers, and he fought on the Western Front. Thankfully, he was alive at the war's end, and he came back to Pernon, and he lived here with his wife for the next 50 years. He would have been able to tell us what happened during the Second World War. And we know that the Germans were here at Chateau de Pernon 
for several days in June 1940 at the end of the fighting during the, the fall of France in May and June 1940. And we know that they were here because we found the newspapers, the German newspapers, that the soldiers must have brought with them during the brief time, three or four days, that German soldiers actually occupied the chateau. Now there is one interesting military connection with this area and the war in Indochina in the 1950s. And that again is with this house that we can see behind us because it was for a time the home of General Roger de Rouffray. And General Roger de Rouffray was the last French combat soldier, he was a lieutenant at the time, to take off from the French firebase at Dien Bien Phu during 1954. It must have been incredible for him to have taken off in a, in a Dakota aircraft packed with wounded soldiers who were lucky enough to be able to leave that firebase before it was sealed off under siege from the Viet Minh during the French war in Indochina. So there are many connections between Chateau de Pernon and the wars the French were involved in in the second half of the 19th century and the 20th century. We hope that answers your question. How are we affording this? Are we receiving government support or any other support and how can you help? Well, as Tim already explained to you earlier, the first stage of protecting and saving Pernod alone is a multi-million dollar project. And whilst Tim and I are giving every single cent that we have, our life savings to this project, that alone is not enough. The restoration of Pernod requires a collaborative effort. And because Pernod is a classe monument historique, we do receive the generous support of the Direction Régionale des Affaires Culturelles, which is the department which looks after and protects historic monuments here in France. On top of that, this year we were incredibly fortunate to be selected for the Mission Bern, thanks to the Fondation du Patrimoine and Stéphane Bern himself. The funds for the Mission Bern come from a lotto which has been created here in France, and it's the Lotto du Patrimoine. And so all the proceeds from this lotto are then distributed to Patrimoine in peril. And thankfully, this year, Pernod will be a recipient of that as well. On top of that, we've also been very fortunate to receive other prizes from the French Heritage Society and the VMF. Even all this put together is still not enough to save Pernod. And so you guys are also playing a very important role in the restoration of Pernod by watching our YouTube videos, subscribing to our Patreon account where we do an exclusive weekly video. And also, if you would like to own your very own piece of the chateau, we salvage the slate that's taken off the roof of the chateau and hand make them into beautiful drink coasters. So thank you to everybody who watches our video, subscribes to our Patreon account and is involved in this huge collaborative effort of saving and restoring Chateau de Pernod. Thanks everyone for watching and sending through your questions. I hope we've managed to answer some of your more burning questions about our life here and the project at Pernod. And we look forward to seeing you next time. See you soon. Take care.